Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. Today's guest is a good friend and colleague of ours at IHMC, Dr. Jerry Pratt. Jerry is a senior research scientist who heads up IHMC's robotics group, which, in 2015, placed second in the DARPA International Robotics Challenge, an achievement that all of us here at IHMC are quite proud of. Yeah, we're very proud of them. And it was great fun getting to know more about Jerry. I actually didn't know that his first invention was the knockout keyless door lock, which he built as a teenager for his tree fort, which is just an awesome story. And Jerry has been inventing ever since. In 2015, he was inducted into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. And in case our listeners haven't heard, our very own STEM Talk host, Ken Ford, will be inducted into the Hall of Fame in September. Thank you, Don. It is indeed an honor to be an inductee and join such an accomplished group of scientists, engineers, and inventors. Of 27 people in the Hall of Fame, four of the inductees are affiliated with IHMC, which is a pretty amazing number. That's very cool. So before we get to today's interview with Jerry, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews that are piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews, with an eye toward selecting the wittiest and lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname Ibru Dank and is titled Life-Changing Education. It reads, STEM Talk has become a key component in my journey of self-education regarding health and wellness, which has had a remarkable impact on my life. I've successfully rid myself of metabolic disease, depression, and anxiety using tools learned on STEM Talk. It is a go-to resource for others in my life who want to learn more about how they can experience revitalized health too. Keep up the fabulous work. That's fantastic. Thank you, Ibru Dank. And thank you to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have provided us with such excellent feedback. Now, on to today's interview with Jerry Pratt. Dr. Jerry Pratt leads a research group at the IHMC that concentrates on understanding and modeling the human gait and applying that knowledge to the field of robotics, human assistive devices, and human machine interfaces. Current projects include humanoid avatar robots for co exploration of hazardous environments, fast and efficient biologically inspired running robots and exoskeletons that are designed to help paralyzed individuals walk. Jerry is a graduate of MIT, where he earned a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science in 2000. As a graduate student at MIT, Jerry developed one of the first bipedal robots that could compliantly walk over rough terrain. It was called Spring Turkey, and today sits in the MIT Museum. After graduation, Pratt and some of his friends from school founded a small company called Yobotics, which specialized in powered prosthetics, biomimetic robots, simulation software, and robotic consulting. Jerry joined IHMC in 2002 and has become a well-known expert in bipedal walking. His algorithms are used in various robots around the world. As we mentioned earlier, Jerry led an IHMC team that placed second out of 23 teams from around the world in the DARPA Robotics Challenge, and placed first among humanoid robots that primarily walk bipedally. Recent work that has focused on fast-running robots has resulted in ostrich-inspired running models and robot prototypes that are currently believed to be the fastest-running robots in the world. Jerry lives in Pensacola and with his wife, Megan, created a science museum called the Pensacola Mess Hall, which stands for Math, Engineering, Science, and Stuff. The Mess Hall is a hands-on science museum for all ages that just celebrated its five-year anniversary. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Carnegie, and today I'd like to welcome to the interview, Jerry Pratt. Jerry, welcome to STEM Talk. Thanks, Don. Yeah, and I'd also like to welcome Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and also chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee. Hi, Don, and hello, Jerry. 
So, Jerry, let's start at the beginning. So I have it on good authority that as a child, you were the perfect student who always did all of his homework. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I also hear that you once stole a science book from school. Can you tell us about uh, that? Yeah, actually, I felt guilty about doing that at the time. Um, yeah, I loved science, and but uh, we never got to do any of the fun, hands-on type stuff. So I stole a science book once and in order to make a motor. Yeah, it was just kind of, you wind your electromagnet or whatever. And so I made this this motor from the book and it kind of went thump, 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 thump. And it was the coolest thing in the world to me. <laughs> but then my brother, he's a couple years older than me and a little bit more talented artistically. So he saw it. And of course, he went and, you know, got a soda can, cut it up, wound it up and had this thing. I was like, going, brr, spinning it like, you know, 1,000 RPM. <laughs> Mine's going thump, thump, thump. <laughs> It's a little bit of competition there. <laughs> so you came up with your first invention as a young teen, and it was for your tree fort, and it was called the Knockout Keyless Door Lock. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was actually something I did for a, a competition. Uh, I won a $10,000 scholarship for it, um, which really helped uh, get me through college. You know, I had the idea for a long time it'd be cool if you had a lock where you could just knock a code to open it up. You'd knock a code when you left, so, you know, da 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 and lock your door. And, and of course, if, if this went to market, that's how everybody would know to break yeah. into right. everybody's house. <laughs> but, um, and then, you'd, you know, you can come back, you knock the same code, and, and it'll let you in. Okay, so, Jerry, when you were 12, the early personal computers arrived on the scene, and there was one in the library that you could tinker with after school. Then you got on the Commodore 64 and wrote your first computer program. Do you recall that first program that you wrote? Yeah, it was called, uh, I called it Pixel Brush 64. It was um, one of the first uh, kind of drawing programs you could do. You know, not, not as fancy as Photoshop now, but it was before you could buy them commercially. And it was super slow, you know, it'd take like two minutes to draw a circle. But it was a lot of fun. Sounds great. In addition to writing computer programs, you also had an interest in electronics. And I understand that we shared a childhood interest in Heath kit kits, and they had these uh, really quite good courses on electronics. Oh, yeah. Heath kit was awesome. I learned all about electronics and computers that way and microprocessors. Yeah, that was good stuff. And so I guess like all of us, you weren't the typical science nerd. <laughs> uh, you also played a lot of sports as a kid, and you even ran varsity track and cross country at MIT. Do you have any recollections that you might like to share with us on those experiences? Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, as a child, I just always wanted to play sports. I mean, that's what I was doing, just running with my friends all the time, playing either basketball, football, track, ran a mile and two mile. Didn't really plan to do anything in college, but then, yeah, I got the itch for it again, so I went out for cross country and track there. But also played a lot of intramurals. Uh, and, uh, at MIT, uh, the intramural system is just amazing. So I played football, basketball, hockey, soccer. Um, had a lot of great teams, uh, a lot of fun. So was it as an undergrad or as a graduate student that you first became interested in robotics? Well, I, I mean, I was a little bit in high school, but there wasn't a lot of opportunities. I had done a, a couple simple robots, but it was really uh, at the start of grad school. I, I guess a little bit undergrad, too. Um, I was in a laboratory where we were doing autonomous helicopters, and I made for my undergrad thesis this is uh, something called, we call it WYSIVision. It was a way to uh, track the helicopters, much like a Vicon motion tracking system of today. It was probably one of the first tracking systems. Uh, but then in, in uh, grad school, I really got into robots with legs. Hmm. The first robot you put together uh, of significance was uh, Spring Turkey. Yep. And this is now in the MIT Museum. The second uh, was Spring Flamingo, which sits in the lobby here at IHMC. I love the names you gave them. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about these machines, and how did you come up with these names? Well, Spring Turkey and Spring Flamingo uh, were yeah, my first two robots uh, at the MIT Lig Laboratory. And uh, the names were pretty interesting. We uh, Spring is in them because they used uh, what we called series elastic actuators, which was a, a actuation system where you put a spring inside the actuator so that you can do really good force control. Before then, most robots were really precisely position controlled, but you couldn't do what we call low impedance control. And then the turkey and flamingo, we were, you know, always wanted to make our robots look like birds at that time. Because we knew if we made them look like humans, uh, we, we would get, you know, all kinds of criticism that we just didn't need. A couple of your colleagues have mentioned that much of our understanding of dynamic walking is still based on some of the original work that you did at MIT. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Sure. There's a few, few different things we did. So one, since we had good force control, low impedance actuators, we could come up with algorithms that weren't based on precise position control, but instead were based on controlling the, the important things of walking. So what's going on with your center of mass, what ground reaction forces are like, things like that. Uh, and that allowed us to walk over a rough terrain without having to have really good knowledge of where the terrain was. So Spring Flamingo could walk up and down like 15 degree slopes without any sensing of the slope whatsoever. 
just, you know, by position of where the feet were. And then we came up with some um, pretty simple models that explain walking pretty well. And some of those are still used today. Perhaps your most important uh, discovery while at MIT, however, was a woman from Pensacola, Florida, Megan Benson. <laughs> Can yep. you tell us how you two met? Yeah, well, we, we met. Within the first week I was there, we had met, but we didn't, uh, you know, start dating until about a year later. But uh, yeah, Megan's great. She's um, she's probably a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so by the way, congratulations. I understand that the two of you just celebrated your 20th anniversary, which is awesome. Yep. And on each anniversary, we tend to find ourselves in different states or different countries, this time different continents. <laughs> I was at a conference in uh, Finland at the time. So you were able to wish her an early uh, happy anniversary then? Uh, yeah. Well, I, you know, sent her an email and didn't realize because of the international dateline that it was actually the wrong day when she read it. <laughs> well, the thought was there. <laughs> After school, you and some friends from MIT co-founded a company called Yobotics, which specialized in powered prosthetics, biomimetic robots, and uh, simulation software, as well as robot consulting. What was that like? What was that whole experience like? Oh, uh, it, was, it was a ton of fun. You know, we, we had no idea what we were doing. We were in over our heads, but we were, but we were able to stay alive. We did a few really neat projects at Yobotics. Uh, one was uh, called the RoboKnee, which was one of the world's first uh, working uh, exoskeleton. We made a agile robot arm and um, did a intelligent patient lifter and then uh, uh, worked uh, in conjunction with IHMC on M2V2, a humanoid robot. Really cool. So after a short time in Washington, D.C., you moved to IHMC in Pensacola. In the early days, there were just four of you at IHMC who were working on robots, which is crazy because now there's around about 30, a core group of 20, and between one or two dozen interns at any given time. Can you give us a summary on the types of robots that you and the others have been working on over the past, how many years would that be? Uh, it's been about 14 years now. Okay. Time flies. It, it really does. And we've We've done quite a number of different robots. We started out doing an uh, underwater exoskeleton. Uh, that was a lot of fun, but as just dealing with water is is there's just so many hassles that uh, that made that project difficult. Uh, then we did a robot called um, Joe Pendulum, which was kind of like a, a Segway balancing robot on two wheels, uh, but then moved on to what we called the T-Bot, which is uh, a robot that can ride around on four wheels, but then uh, kip up into a mode where it's uh, riding on two wheels uh, so that it has more maneuverability. Uh, after the T-Bot, we started working on a running robot, just a one-legged to start uh, that was hydraulically powered. So it's hydraulic monopod that would run around in circles. Uh, and, you know, we learned a lot about how to do hydraulic power and for, for running robots. I've got, got so many robots to talk about here. <laughs> you know, just, I don't know if this is going to bore people or whatever. No, it's all but, really uh, cool. Yeah, and the, the robot M2V2 was a lower body humanoid that we used for studying push recovery. So as you, you know, bump into something or have a lot of wind or get pushed, uh, where do you have to step to or how can you, uh, you know, change your center pressure on your foot in order to balance? We then had a project called Little Dog where that robot was actually built by Boston Dynamics, but we had to write the software for it to walk over a really rough terrain. We've also been working on some open loop uh, running robots uh, in a fast runner project. The most recent one is called the planar elliptical runner. It, it runs on a treadmill. Uh, it's only planar. It doesn't have to worry about side to side balance, but it can run with a single motor, no feedback, no sensors, just completely open loop stable. Um, so that's pretty cool from a scientific point of view, because a lot of people think that a lot of animal balance is done just open loop with no, no feedback control. And then uh, more recently, we've been getting back into um, full body humanoid robots uh, with some Boston Dynamics robot called Atlas and a uh, NASA robot called Valkyrie. Well, beyond all this impressive work that you've been doing with robots, I also understand, and I know you and I have talked about this in the past, that you read a lot of books about organizational culture and team building. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, agile planning and agile programming practices. And when I first heard about it, I was I found a bunch of books and I loved them so much. I stayed up till about three in the morning each night reading through uh, five different books on the topic. Uh, part of the reason was um, before we started doing a lot of unit testing, we're kind of like a normal lab where you just kind of hack together code. And you can do that to some extent, but once things start getting more and more and more complicated and you got layer upon layer upon layer, each layer has to be super reliable for the next layer to work. So once we started doing unit testing, I just fell in love with it. And now I just make sure that the first thing anybody learns when they come into the lab is how to do really good unit testing. Hmm. 
That's fantastic. And that's why you guys are as efficient as you are. And you guys have these moving parts and pieces with the interns coming out too, which you, you can make that happen efficiently. Exactly. And when if you know, you know, if you can teach the interns really good programming practices in the first couple of weeks, then you can trust them to uh, contribute to the code base as if they've been here for years without having to worry about them ruining things. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. So I also have it on good authority that you're one of the worst motivational speakers ever. Is that true? Uh, <laughs> yes. In fact, when I, you know, I'm not going to give a brave heart speech style to, uh, to the group. I, I try to lead by example and lead by letting people have, you know, the, the um, freedom to lead themselves. Yeah. I know that you and the robotics team put a lot of work into the uh, DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, that was essentially three years of heavy-duty effort and pr- lots of preparation, and certainly it paid off. HMC placed second in the world in the competition and first among the U.S. teams. That must have been a great experience for you and the other folks that worked on the project. Can you describe this experience in a nutshell? Yeah, sure. The, the DARPA Robotics Challenge was amazing. It was a lot of hard work, but it was exactly what we've all been wanting to work on. So we you know, had a humanoid robot, the Atlas, provided by Boston Dynamics, and we had to get it to do a lot of things that were, at first blush, sound really crazy, like drive a car, drill through a wall, you know, go over rough terrain, which is what we've always been interested in, do some manipulation things, uh, climb stairs. Um, but we were able to do all those challenges and uh, do pretty well in the contest. The uh, challenge was interesting in that it involved more than just mobility. But if you were designing a new challenge to focus really on robotic mobility, uh, what would it look like? I would personally make one that was a bit cha- more challenging than DARPA Robotics Challenge. So with the DRC, you could get away with doing wheeled or tracked robots a bit. It wasn't uh, that terribly hard. But if you start adding things like jersey barriers that you need to get over, big gaps that you need to cross, uh, ladders that you need to climb, that sort of thing, that's really where a humanoid form is is really important. And there's a story that you told coming out of the DRC. Uh, you're talking about your daughter, Annie, and how her kindergarten teacher had asked her what her daddy did for a living. And she said that her daddy built robots. And when the teacher asked her what the robots did, she said they fall down. <laughs> yeah, 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 they fall down. Yeah, Annie, Annie likes to joke when she was uh, first started uh, preschool. The teachers were asking her, you know, what color is that? When she said, oh, that's green. It's like, no, no, Annie, that's blue. She's like, oh, okay. What color is that? Oh, that's orange. No, and they were afraid she didn't know her colors. It's like, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just testing you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's that saying? Out of the mouths of babes, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you've spent most of your career thinking about how humans balance themselves and the steps that we take to keep from falling, and how we might be able to use those same strategies to help balance robots. Can you walk us through that process? Yeah, sure. There's really when when humans are balancing and it's going to be the same physics with with robots, you pretty much have a f- few different strategies you can use. Uh, one is to move your center of pressure on your foot. So, you, you know, you can kind of feel where the weight is on your foot and you use your ankle torques mostly to move that around. Another one you can do is, is uh, what we call the angular momentum strategy, where you throw around, like if you can windmill your arms or you lunge your body if you're, if you're about to fall, like you can imagine a, a gymnast walking on a balance beam. Uh, tilts left to the right, mm-hmm. you know, she windmill her arms. Uh, and then the uh, taking a step. So, you know, if you, if you can't recover from one of those two methods, then you take a large step to recover. So that's what we do. Can you talk us through what happens when a robot recovers its balance? Uh, we, do, we try to do the exact same things. Okay. So what we do uh, from the robotics point of view is try to come up with simple models that explain these things. And, and they're very simple models typically is all you need, like a point mass uh, inverted pendulum. Um, you might add like a flywheel to kind of capture the, the angular momentum and then, you know, just a, having a, a simple leg to take a step. So what we've done mostly is come up with these simple models and from the simple models be able to develop controllers that work on the simple models uh, kind of provably and then use them on the real robot. Uh, so it might not be perfect, but it still works. No. So your focus has been on bipedal walking, and I'm sure you get this question a lot. We know that humans are not the fastest, the most agile, or even the most stable-legged creatures. So for robots, why legs and why only two legs? Mm -hmm. Well, humans are actually extremely efficient when they're walking, more efficient than any other animal uh, at that speed. Uh, We're not very good at running, but, you know, the uh, ostriches are great at running with two legs, and, and cheetahs are great with running at four legs. But the reason you want to be humanoid form, I think, is because you're able to get wherever a human can get to if you do your job well building the robot. 
And it's amazing just the places that human can get, humans can get to on the Earth's surface. Just about anywhere any animal of that size can get to. You know, mountain goats are really good at getting on the edges of mountains, but it's really that they're just super brave. Humans can get wherever mountain goat can get. Yeah. And one of the advantages for a, a humanoid robot or a bipedal robot is the physical built world was mm -hmm. built assuming our form factor. Right. And so exactly. we've, we've built it for us. Right, exactly. And, and so if we're going to build robots that live in the same environments that humans live in without having to do really expensive modifications to those environments, then having something that looks like a human uh, is, is the way to go. And maybe they won't look exactly human. You know, no, and really, when I talk to people about this, there's almost no one who debates that you want arms with hands. And it makes sense to have two. doesn't really make sense to have three arms, right? So uh, where the debate comes in is, do you want to have legs? Do you want two legs, four legs? Uh, or do you want wheels, tracks, whatever? And I think if we can actually build these robots so that they work well, then it makes sense to just have two legs because, well, four would be more expensive. And, you know, when it comes down to it, humans are quadrupeds. We've got four appendages. We move around great on our four appendages, but usually we walk on two. Right. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, some of walking can be thought of as modeled by an inverted pendulum. When is this approximation uh, valid and under what conditions does this simplification break down? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very valid on flat ground walking, even if you're taking large steps. Where it starts breaking down is um, if you're making uh, large center mass uh, height changes. Uh, and part of that, the model we often use too, is that we assume that that center mass stays at a constant height. Once you lose that assumption, then a lot of the math becomes a little bit more complicated and you can't solve things in closed form. You need to start doing numerical type solutions. But I'd say the simple models that we use capture about 90% of what's going on. And so which is the more limiting factor in having a bipedal robot perform as well as a human, the software or the hardware? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, the above. And, right. And, and there's many dimensions on both the hardware and the software. From the hardware point of view, actuators are still a major limiting factor. Human muscle or just muscle in general is, is amazing. Uh, we really haven't been able to make actuators that have the same properties as muscle. We can kind of beat a lot of the muscle properties with actuators, but not all of them. You know, like, you know, we might be able to get better power to weight in a certain type of actuator, you know, just getting everything that muscle's good at. So high power to weight, low volume, low mass, uh, let's see, or high efficiency. I mean, there's just a lot of things that, that are great about muscle. And so right now, bipedal robots are now able to walk, but they do it pretty slowly. So mm -hmm. what are the challenges in getting them to run? Right. So um, one of the reasons the the humanoid robots right now are so slow is, is because of this actuator problem. When you choose an actuator, you have to decide, geez, are we going to go for a lot of force or a lot of, or a lot of velocity? And what should the gear ratio be to, as, as a trade-off? And usually you have to have enough force or torque at your joints so that you can, say, go upstairs or do deep knee bends. And because of the actuator limitations, as soon as you make that trade-off, now the robot's slow. Mm -hmm. Another reason they're really slow, though, is our operator interfaces still need a lot of work. And a lot of times when you watch a robot and it's just not moving for a few seconds, it's because the operator's doing something. And to the operator, it seems like really exciting. You know, you're doing all this stuff. But to a person watching the robot, it's just sitting there. Right. As you've mentioned a few times, uh, our robots are comprised of lots and lots of actuators and sensors and perform complicated calculations, hundreds or perhaps thousands of times a second. How practical and robust is this solution in the real world? You mentioned earlier that you and others uh, in your group are looking at less complex and more resilient solutions. How could this fundamental research into running be leveraged into your work with humanoids, or are they distinctly separate tracks with no crosstalk? Right. Well, one of the things we're trying to do is uh, what we call um, exploiting natural dynamics. So a lot of walking is performed simply by the mechanism itself. And that's what we're showing with the Fast Runner Project and Planar Elliptical Runner, is that you don't need a lot of feedback necessarily. If you build the smarts into the mechanism, most of the job will be done by the, by the robot itself. 
And there's there's been a, a number of walking robots that also um, exploit natural dynamics. Uh, they're usually called passive dynamic walkers. And the early work we did on spring turkey and spring flamingo, we took that approach a lot where we tried to put the a lot of the smarts in the mechanism and only do as much control as was absolutely needed. But we've moved away from that recently with Atlas and Valkyrie because we actually have to get something done in the real world with these robots. It's not that we're just trying to walk efficiently on flat ground. We're trying to get, you know, to a valve, turn the valve, flick a switch, you know, all these other things. And it needs to be done super reliably. So recently we've been using more mathematically precise techniques, uh, kind of, you know, robotics 101. But because of that, the robots don't look as natural. They're not as efficient and they're, because they're not exploiting the natural dynamics. So one of the things I'm really interested in is trying to figure out how you can come up with a controller that doesn't over-control everything, that exploits the natural dynamics, but is still mathematically precise and provably correct. So, Jared, can you explain to our listeners some of the potentially practical applications of bipedal robots? And we've talked a little bit about moving around in a, in a human-built world. So why is this such important work? Mm-hmm. Well, where where they be useful right now um, immediately is places where you want a human presence, uh, but it's too expensive or too dangerous to have a human there. Mm -hmm. So things like um, nuclear decommissioning, possibly Mars exploration, possibly uh, things of that nature. I've noticed uh, in the lab that you and others have been working to get a humanoid robot that's uh, Atlas running in our Atlas robot to walk across a plank of wood that was seesawing up and down. Uh, wh why are you doing that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's our poor man's version of a uh, aircraft carrier or a ship at sea that's pitching in, in <laughs> high sea conditions. So we've got a lever arm where somebody can grab it and, and push it up and down while the robot's walking over the, the planks. That was really pitching up and down. I've never seen an aircraft carrier pitch quite that much. <laughs> well, may maybe some of your smaller vessels. Yeah. <laughs> we could do some of our seasickness training over there, too, then. <laughs> I'll have to use that later. <laughs> I was like, what are they doing to that poor guy? <laughs> Um, so what are some of the most efficient gates as far as different animals go? And how does bipedal walking compare to some of those gates in terms of efficiency and also programmability? Okay, well... Just walking in general is efficient because as the system's moving, either the animal or the robot or whatever, you're kind of conserving energy as the pendulum goes you know, up, it's changing kinetic energy to potential energy. Then when it comes down, it's changing potential energy to kinetic energy. And really where you lose your energy is when you take a step and have to have impacts with the ground or change this direction of potential energy and kinetic energy. And you can source some of that energy in, in a spring. Um, you know, theoretically, there's no reason why you can't walk uh, with 100% uh, efficiency, no energy requirements at all. But there's a lot of practical issues of uh, speeding up a leg, slowing it down, and just not having the type of actuation systems that can do perfect uh, energy reclamation. Mm -hmm. Um, but then running's a bit different in that it's not like an inverted pendulum. It's a lot more like a bouncing ball where as you land, you're compressing uh, your tendons and ligaments and kind of springy stuff. Uh, and then that stores some of the energy and then uh, returns it on the next step. So, you know, a really, any, a really efficient animal might return around half of the energy on each step uh, through springiness in the legs. So what an so an ostrich, I know we've talked about ostriches being relatively efficient. Yeah, well, ostriches, I mean, you definitely see it more in a, like in a kangaroo, though, where it's, mm. you know, you big tendon that's storing a lot of energy and bouncing. Ostriches go so darn fast that their center of mass hardly goes up and down at all. Mm. And that's what enables us with the planar elliptical runner uh, to figure out how to do an open loop uh, stable trajectory. Because of some of the properties of, of just fast running like that, where you're not bouncing that much, um, things like where you step doesn't really matter so much, Where whereas um, if you have more of a hopping robot or a more kangaroo-like robot, it's, uh, speed control is so, is so important uh, where you step. Mm -hmm. But with fast running like an ostrich, it's not really that critical. So you can do these open loop trajectories that are really, uh, really robust. It just doesn't really matter where the foot lands. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience.
You've been spending a lot of time thinking about how robots can help us explore Mars. You mentioned it earlier, in fact. And, uh, you know, as everyone knows, there are several robots on Mars now, and they've been very, very useful. But these are all wheeled or tracked machines. Do you see the need for robots with legs on Mars, and, uh, and why? I, I think so for exploring a lot of parts of Mars that have uh, mountainous terrain and, you know, just places that these wheeled vehicles can't get to. Uh, that's where you might want to have uh, legged robots. Whether or not you need uh, two legs or four legs, that's still yet to be seen. And then as we build um, the habitats on Mars, there'll probably be a lot of scenarios where you have the robots do precursor missions where they set things up before the astronauts get there and then do maintenance after the astronauts leave or even while they're there. And in order to get all the places that the astronauts can get inside their habitats, maybe having the human form is advantageous. Agreed. How does walking and running differ on Earth versus uh Typically, uh, lower gravity environments like Mars, but also, you know, potentially even higher gravity environments. First of all, there's no such thing as walking or running if you don't have gravity. And it's kind of interesting to think about it. We're really in this kind of love-hate relationship between us and the Earth. You know, it's trying to pull us down and make us fall. But if it wasn't doing that, we wouldn't be able to have traction on the ground and we'd just separate from the Earth and float and, and not be able to walk or locomote at all. We'd all be Major Tom. It's exactly. So as, so as gravity decreases, like on the moon, then you'll find that you can only walk at a certain speed. Once you hit um, a certain speed, you're going to want to run sooner. So that's why the astronauts kind of hopped around, uh, just because there wasn't enough force pulling them to the ground, such that walking allowed you to, to walk fast enough at a comfortable gait. If the gravity was, say, double Earth, then you probably wouldn't run much. You'd just be able to walk really fast and it'd be really exhausting, you know, with even muscle probably wouldn't allow us mm -hmm. to walk on gravity that's twice Earth. Mars uh, seems to be uh, interesting in that it's right in a sweet spot. You know, would we actually walk on Mars or hop like we did on the moon? Or w do you think it'd be partially a function of the spacesuit design? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's, that's a good question. And, and I like to kind of phrase it with saying, you know, are we ever going to walk on Mars or are we going to hop? <laughs> um, and it's it's a really good question because clearly on the moon we hopped around is you know each each astronaut kind of had figured out its his own gate but most of them were ones where you had an aerial phase um, on Mars if you look at the the conditions that limits walking speed one is how quickly you can swing your leg and that doesn't really change with gravity and then one is when do you start losing contact with the surface based on your speed because as your pendulum comes up and over you kind of have the centrifugal force pulling you away from the ground so at certain speeds you want to just lose contact with the ground. And if you kind of plot those two things, uh, it makes it really clear that on the moon you want to hop and on Earth you want to walk, but on Mars it's really not clear which of the two you'll want to do. Yeah, and it's important to appreciate that these aren't humans walking on Mars or the moon. It's a human encased in a pressurized volume. Right. Mm -hmm. So on the moon you had a big spring effect from the suit. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And it's also took longer to swing your leg. Mm -hmm. So, you you know, walking speed is really dependent on how quickly you can swing a leg. If you can't swing it fast enough, then you have to get airborne so that you have more time to swing your leg through. So that would indicate in it with a poorly designed spacesuit that you'd probably want to hop even more. Mm -hmm. As far as sensory input goes, the skin is our largest sensory organ that we have as humans. Do you see the ability to integrate things like synthetic skin with robots to improve their interaction with the environment generally? Ab absolutely. And that's one of the technologies that will be really exciting once once it's developed. There's a lot of, lot of colleagues working on better skin sensors for robots, and they've got a lot of cool things in the pipeline. But there's a lot of practical issues that, that make it difficult to make it for robots currently. But if you think about an uh, animal or a human, you have like 10,000 pressure sensors per square inch on your skin. So anytime you touch something or whatever, you just get this image of what it is, even through your feet. So as you're walking over rough terrain, you can kind of visualize what's underneath you. And based on that, you can determine uh, what sort of strategy you need to walk. So for example, if you're walking on a line contact, like, you know, a real narrow beam, you just feel that and you know that you can't put your center of pressure outside of that line. Uh, so instantaneously, it's almost like you, you see it. We don't have really good sensors like that on our robots right now. All we can measure is where the overall center of pressure is 
is. So what we have to do for walking on line contacts is uh, kind of explore, move the move the ankle around a bit to feel what's underneath it. And then once we feel what's underneath it, then we can adapt our algorithm to say, okay, I'm on a line contact. I now need to use my upper body arms to, you know, give us this angular momentum for balancing. And I need to really quickly take my next step because otherwise I'm going to fall down. So Jerry, I know in undersea robotics, one of the major issues, and I know this is the same for terrestrial robotics, uh, that developing a hand with dexterity that simulates a human is, is very, very difficult. So what are the challenges in that? And where does the field stand with respect to developing a, a good hand? Right. That, that's absolutely right. And I think the hand itself is as hard, if not harder, than all the rest of the robot. Um, there's been a lot of hands developed throughout the years, but it comes down to really practical issues of having small actuators that have good strength, not having the hand break when you fall on it without, you know, a lot of force. Mm -hmm. And I guess part, part of the problem with hands is, and with robots in general, is most of our actuators are made out of metal and are really, you know, not, not very compliant or soft, whereas muscle is nice and soft. So if you fall or bump into something, you naturally have this padding there, uh, whereas robots are so fragile because of all this metal that can break. In nature, uh, everything's kind of built with uh, tensegrity type structures where you have compression elements, your bones, and you have your tension elements, uh, like your muscles and your tendons. And because of that, you can have things like just a ball and socket joint that if the muscles and tendons weren't there, it just falls apart, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really held together. Um, but because of that, there's no, there's no extra loading you have to worry about. Whereas when you make a robot, every joint you make, you typically have a bunch of bearings and a lot of structure because it has to take up all these side loads that you don't have um, muscles or tendons taking up. Interestingly, uh, understanding robotics and AI doesn't seem to diminish our appreciation for humanity, yeah. but rather seems to elevate it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and it's just amazing to watch animals and just see that, you know, a cat can go and jump on top of a refrigerator <laughs> and, you know, just how fast animals work. And it's just really incredible to, to think about. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And so just as an aside, you and your wife, Megan, when you two moved here about 14 years ago, you had this dream of creating a science museum. And in your spare time, uh, which I'm not sure how much of that you actually have, but you've actually managed to do that. So how did that happen? Yeah, we've we've always been big fans of science museums. When we first moved to Pensacola, we started talking about, hey, it'd be great to have a science museum here. But it was, it was always just a really daunting thing to do. Um, so when Megan, Megan was working here at IHMC a while ago and, and started a few outreach programs, Science Saturday, which is still going on today, I Love Science, and, and a few others. And that really helped address some of the need for third, fourth, and fifth graders. But, you know, there's a big need for everybody else, too. And so finally, I kind of pushed her to, okay, Megan, it's time to start the Science Museum. We've been talking about it too long. Let's just do it. She's like, okay, well, where am I going to get the money for the exhibits? And I was like, look, we can get local people to build exhibits. Bits, I think. Yeah. And I'm going to prove that to you by making three myself in the garage. Tell me which ones we should do. <laughs> so she gave me a few exhibits and I built them and, and it, you know, it was about a thousand bucks each and maybe 60 hours of work each. So it's, you know, completely doable. Um, and I, I joke around with my kids, you know, that's where people are going to enter and that'll be the gift shop. And like, dad, you can't <laughs> have a science museum in the garage. <laughs> sure we can. Um, but a typical science museum has around 100 to 200 of these exhibits. Right. So it's still like, Ugh, and takes about 10,000 square feet. But then Megan came up with this great idea to make uh, science exhibits in a little box. So we call them mess kits, much like what you would eat at a Navy cafeteria. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the science museum is called the mess hall. And when you come in, there's on the wall is a menu that shows all the different mess kits you can order. And you come up with your blue tray and you, you know, you order your balancing pencil or your, you know, whatever exhibit and you get it and you sit down and then take about, you know, anywhere from five to 20 minutes each. And we've got about 200 of them now and we have 20 on the menu at any given time. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that, so that allowed us to be in a 4,000 square foot space mm -hmm. with, you know, with about 10 normal exhibits and all these mess kits. And then we've just grown since then been about five years ago we we got it off the ground That's the cool. mess kits were a, a really breakthrough idea yeah absolutely yeah. computers are of course more capable than people in some ways and less capable than people in others <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, in what ways is mechanical mobility starting to surpass uh human mobility 
And then where do you see the next breakthroughs coming in machine mobility? Mm -hmm. Well, you might have heard the phrase a lot of times that the hard things are easy and the easy things are hard. Mm -hmm. You know, like easy things for a human is just to identify patterns, recognize faces, that sort of thing. And that, that was often hard for computers. With mobility, things that require a lot of really quick reaction time, robots are great at. So the one thing our humanoid robots are better at humans than right now is balancing on a single foot hmm. um, because we have a better sensing of our orientation with, you know, really high rate gyroscopes and our control feedback loops are going at about a thousand times a second or with the human, it's more around 50. Um, and then there's just more precision in what's happening. We have really precise estimation of where our center of mass is. So things like that, you know, there's robots out there that can that can do things so much quicker than a human. Uh, there's one that can play rock, paper, scissors against a human and win every time because the moment that you chose your thing, it chooses its thing like a millisecond later and you can't detect it. <laughs> so those sort of things are easy for robots and will continue to be improved more and more and more. Uh, the hard things for, for robots are figuring out like where to step next. If you're walking on a pile of cinder blocks or a rough terrain or whatever, and you start losing your balance and you really quickly have to decide, gee, I can step right there. For a human, it's just obvious. It's like, yeah, that's a flat place. I can step there. It's going to wobble this way, so I'll step on this corner. And you do it without even thinking about it. Uh, doing that sort of planning and reacting with the robots has been really challenging for us. So, Jerry, about 10 years ago or so, researchers set a goal or predicted that we would have a robot soccer team that would beat a human team by 2050. Do you think that's still possible by 2050? Uh, I, I don't know. I <laughs> If... Certainly, if you can have wheels on the robots, then yes, we can do it today. <laughs> Just put, you know, 10 tanks out there and, and we've got it. Um, but ones that are actually humanoid, that look like humans and act like humans, I'm not sure. Um, what, it's, what it's going to take, I believe, is a new type of actuator that acts um, like muscle does. And in fact, you know, there might be a way to make some, you know, nanotech style muscle that has, you know, billions of little latches and hooks that, you know, much like the, the things going on inside muscle, uh, that then gives us the same property as muscle, or maybe it's some other technology. But the things we have today, electric motors, uh, they're pretty good, but you need um, transmissions, which add weight and complexity and, and volume. And, and hydraulics are a lot higher um, power than electric, but they also have a lot of volume um, and aren't very efficient. And those are pretty much the two energy sources we have to choose from, the two actuator types. So I think the big thing to get in uh, there physically is better actuators. From a control point of view, I think we can get there. Your group also works on powered exoskeletons for people with paralysis. Currently, all of the balance, though, is provided by the user. Are there ways to utilize your work on walking and the balancing algorithms that you and your group are developing in powered exoskeleton development so that the exoskeleton itself can be a more active partner in balance. Yeah, that's that's one of our big goals, using what we've learned from humanoid robots to make exoskeletons that can balance themselves. Uh, right now we have um, Mark Daniels, our, our pilot in our exoskeleton, and he has really good sense of balance. He's you know very athletic, except that he can't move or feel anything from the belly button down. But he's able to do really good balance control, but it but it takes a lot of his attention and yeah, and, and he has to really put a lot of effort into it. It'd be nice to Maybe, maybe even if we don't completely do the balance for him, just add things that augment his, his abilities would be great. Sure, sort of orthotic function. Exactly. Okay, so Jerry, given your expertise in walking, what's your advice to a race walker that wants to do well without cheating or with cheating but hard to detect? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, you know, I'm sure they've tried everything. And, um, and the rules are such that, you know, we can point at our models and show why the rules are such that they are, because if you allow a person to bend their knee more, they can, they can go much faster. There's this thing called Groucho running. Groucho Marx would walk really quickly, but he was actually dynamically running. If you actually look at what the interplay of like the center of mass was, he's actually kind of bouncing on a spring, much like running, mm -hmm. even though his feet are al always on the ground. So if you Groucho run or Groucho walk, you can go much faster than these race walkers. Um, and if you allow one of these race walkers to be able to do that, they can, they can really go fast. 
So these, these rules are kind of artificial just to make sure they're walking and not running. You know, large animals like an elephant, uh, they run without having a flight phase. They always have feet on the ground, even when they're running. And it's because they're doing this kind of groucho run thing where they've, um, where their center mass is bouncing and they're, they have bent knees as they're taking a step. Hmm. That's really interesting. I'll have to watch an elephant run. <laughs> now that yeah. that. <laughs> so Groucho studied uh, biomimetic running. Oh, right? yeah. There's, there's a lot. Oh, you did know, he really? Oh, no, you're nah. joking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I and, was like, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, you know, you a, can cut that out, Billy. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, there's a lot of our colleagues, uh, you know, if you look at the, um, the animation people did with the Roadrunner, it looks a lot like our planar elliptical runner. And I always put slides of the Roadrunner up and, you know, that's the 1950s. <laughs> so it that, does, absolutely. So animators actually have a really good intuition of how, of how motion works. Yeah. And it's, you know, and that's why if you watch a, a lot of cartoons or, you know, computer graphic type stuff, you know, one of the things I try to do is kind of watch like how the feet hit the ground and is the walking natural and all that. And and oftentimes like, wow, it looks like this is motion capture. And then you go read about it and it's like, no, it's just, you know, some animator coming up with, uh, with scripts that look really natural. That's really interesting. So what role do you see for hot topics like deep neural nets and other AI techniques in helping to advance mobility? Mm -hmm. I think like just about every other field, the, the, Machine learning is going to knock down our field one of these days. The question is when. And it's something we're starting to get interested in, too, how you can use deep reinforcement learning to generate uh, bipedal walking algorithms. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the, I think it's kind of one of the next problems people are going to be tackling. A lot of people have been already, well, a few, but I think the the deep learning, um, deep reinforcement learning community is going to start looking at bipedal walking as the next a uh, big problem to the big challenge because there's a lot of interesting things going on. If you know, they've with simple like Atari video games, they're now better than humans, but where you need either long-term planning, they're not yet better or where there's really complex dynamics. Um, that's not just like, um, really quick reaction, like in a breakout, but, um, something like walking where, where you know, you're kind of always precariously perched. And if you take the wrong action for a little bit of time, you fall down and have, you know, how do you reward falling one way versus the other? How do you compare that when you're trying to learn? Mm -hmm. But I think what's the way to approach it is kind of the same way humans learn to walk is first learn to crawl and then learn how to stand up and then learn how to balance while not walking and then mm -hmm. learn how to take steps and take, you know, little pieces to get there. And you could either do this automatically or, or use human training you know, I have an expert that's kind of training the system and saying, okay, now try, now here's your next goal, mm -hmm. learn how to do that. And now here's your next goal, learn how to do that. But I, but I do think it's going to be one of these things, maybe, maybe 10 years from now, everybody who works in walking will be using these deep learning algorithms. Yeah, it's a, it's an ideal application for mm -hmm. those sort of algorithms because one doesn't need to explain how they arrived at the capability to walk. Right. Exactly. And so in many applications, these algorithms are frustrating in that you can't explain right. the behavior of the device. In this case, it wouldn't even matter. Well, I, but it depends what your goals are. If your goals are to understand walking, then it would matter. Then you'd want to open up the box. Well, of course. And that's, that's kind of been uh, our approach f uh, over the years is not just make robots that are good at walking, but also in the in the same vein, learn what walking is about and what, you know, and how humans work. Yeah, you won't learn that by a deep learning no, algorithm. And, and, unless people can start figuring out how you can explain what went on and open up the box. And, and maybe there, you know, that's, I think that's an exciting thing to study too, just in general with learning is what actually was learned. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge yeah. for humans. You know, if, yeah. mm -hmm. if yeah. you say to me, well, why did you say that? I could say, well, I had spreading activation in my frontal lobe, <laughs> right. which activated Wernicke's area, and yep. I produced uh, vibrations that you took to be a knowledge claim. Exactly. And that's not a very useful explanation. No, right. no, no. But what I'm interested in seeing is things like, yeah, you know, one thing that deep learning is good at is figuring out what the salient features in the data fed to it is. Definitely. And will you, you know, once you have something learning to walk, will you be able to open up the box and see things like, oh, look, right there, it figured out what the center of pressure is and the mm -hmm. center of mass and all these things that humans have come up with to m simplify it so that we can understand what's going on. Will those be there too, or will it just be a complete spaghetti mess? It's, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So, Jerry, what do you see as the emerging commercial opportunities for robotics? 
Uh, well, there's there's tons of robot companies sprouting up now. Um, a lot of them are things f- like uh, working in um, warehouses, moving packages around, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, been a few companies that have been successful in that. Uh, there's been surgical robots for a long time, which you know are not actually autonomous, but you know tools for helping human surgeons. On the factory line, there's now robots who interact with humans better. So, like, um, instead of just going and spray painting something, you can actually have a human working with robot and say, "Hey, I'm doing this task. Can you help me? This is this is how I do it," and kind of program it on the assembly line right then and there. Mm-hmm. So that that's a big thing now. But getting robots in the home that's that's the hard one, and that's what I mean. That's what people really want to see. Um, but it's but it's tough. There's there's been a few. Uh, that have been sprouting up. There's this one company now that has a, a machine, a robot that will fold your laundry now. It's two robot arms in a box and you pour your laundry in and then you open the drawer on the bottom a few hours later and you've got folded laundry. Mm-hmm. And wow, I mean, that's that's great, but you still have to you know pour the laundry in. So you see more and more machines that help out in the same way a dishwasher helps out, but still just like doing the loading and the unloading of these, that's going to be a while because that's actually one of those things that are Really easy for a human to do, but really hard for a robot right now. Right. And so what about opportunities for entertainment? Oh, there's all kinds of, you know, from robot theme parks to uh, we're working with um, um, Megabots, which are making these 20 foot tall fighting robots that have two pilots in it. Uh, and they're, they've got a duel coming up with a Japanese robot called Karatis. So mm-hmm. that'll be exciting to watch. You know, so maybe maybe someday we'll also get to the the scenario in the movie Real Steel where you've got you know, boxing robots, that mm-hmm. would be amazing if that actually started driving the field. You know, just anything that can get more more excitement and more, frankly, more money uh, thrown at the problem, then the faster it'll get developed. Yep. Can you give us uh, a quick update and sketch on IHMC's role in the whole Megabot adventure you just mentioned? Yeah, so for, for Megabots, we're, we're writing the software. So they're they're doing all the hardware, we're doing the software and some of the kind of low-level interfaces for, for the software talking to the hardware. Um, so the, our, one of our biggest challenges is just kind of figuring out how to translate from what the human is doing with the, the, the cockpit things. He's got a couple of joysticks and a bunch of buttons. How to transform from that to what the robot should be doing. So, Jerry, on a personal note, I understand that you love puzzles and games, and Mm -hmm. I'm told that you will spend hours mathematically proving the odds of a game, (laughs) or that you sometimes work all night on a programming challenge, or even stay up late playing a strategy game. So, can you tell us a little Uh bit about that? Well, you know, engineering and doing robotics is one big puzzle, you know, and and it's a huge multidimensional puzzle, even including things like, you know, how do we get funded for this? How do we, you know, <laughs> make sure we don't get our funding cut for this? And how do you get keep the team happy? And yeah, and, and I think just, I've always just been a huge fan of games and puzzles. And, you know, a puzzle is just a one player game, right? So um, not sure why, I just, just always been a big fan of them. Well, this was great fun, Jerry, and time has flown by. Uh, yeah. Thank you for being our guest on You're STEM Talk. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. That's been great. Thanks. STEM talk. 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 Man, that was such a fun interview with Jerry. His passion for the work he does definitely comes through, and not just robots. I love the fact that he is constantly learning about so many different topics to keep on his mental toes, so to speak. Absolutely. Where are his mental toes? <laughs> That's a study that I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's developed a strong and well-respected team in the field of robotics, and running a team that is so accomplished doesn't happen by mistake. He is an absolute asset to IHMC through his intellect, character, and continuous drive to do great work. He's definitely an inspiration, and I have to say that I'm honored to have him as a colleague. If you enjoyed this interview as much as we did, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes, stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.